Well, this is how to spot the Caslin font. And of course, I mean the Caslin typeface. Of course, of course. So here we go. Caslin uh, was an English type founder. His types, uh, they look a bit old fashioned, but they're great for reading and many versions exist today. And now we're gonna learn what Caslin is. Uh, well, that's what he looks like. There's a picture of him way back in 1730. He really started like 1720. And look, he's holding his font poster. Way to go, Bill. Over here is how he started. Um, his first uh, job was um, engraving gun barrels and gun handles. Kind of like this. That's not his work, but it looks like what he did. Uh, he had a real artistic flair for decorating and for letters and for... Um, uh, working with steel to engrave things and someone pointed out that's how you make fonts you have to engrave these punches and then bang them into the, gr the brass and then mold them you might want to try to make a font and he thought well okay maybe there's money in it and oddly enough the first one he did was Arabic back in the early 1700s there it is I should mention the word English English Arabic that's not means it's from England. English was the name for a size of type. Like they didn't have 10 point, 12 point, 18 point, all that. They had names for the sizes. Kind of like at the store that you've got, you know, sample size, regular size, giant size, family size, travel size. Uh, similar there, back in fonts, they had names for their sizes. That's what that's about. Um, I recognize a couple letters, but this is, my Arabic sucks, so never mind. That's a K right there and an L. <laughs> Here we go, next slide. This is um, his font poster. He was successful in making that one typeface and said, I'm gonna make a bunch more. Um, and as I said, this is like 1720 in London. And this is a reproduction of his font poster and it gets printed a lot at those colonial reproduction villages where you can see a genuine blacksmith in a genuine print shop. Um, I think that's where I got this from a long time ago. But, um, because London was a university city, there was a need to have all types of fonts. Oh, that's a funny thing to say, isn't it? There's Greek, there's Hebrew, there's Arabic. Again, there's the Sumerian, Syriac, Armenian, Coptic, Gothic, all kinds of strange non-English languages. The typefaces up close are not that nice to look at, but when you set a page full of it in text, it's quite readable. Um, it's been overlooked the last couple of years, but um, it's a nice alternative to Times or Palatino or those guys. So here we go, some more stuff about Caslon. To remember it, this is one way I, I keep it in my head, that the capital T looks sort of like an anchor, kind of. And the capital A reminds me of this. Funny, huh? Um, in general, it looks sort of like Garamond, but it's a couple years later. This is what now has become... Uh, Lucky boy over on uh, uh, Walnut Street, I think it is. So here it is up close, and see the capital T looks sort of like an anchor. It's got serifs that go above the top, kind of like Garamond did, but they're the same angle, and it's symmetrical, and it's kind of broad and anchor-shaped. And the capital A has got this funny thing on the top where sometimes it's got a scoop out of it, and sometimes it's just sticking up, and that's quick ways to spot it. Um, in general, in capital E's and F's and other letters, they've got wedges here, like here, and here, and here, and here, to make those uh, end serifs. That's their strategy. Uh, here's Caslon again, all caps, and this is on a an awning not far from 85 degrees in Old Town. I think this is on uh, Raymond Street. Nope, sorry, Fair Oaks. But there we go. There's the capital A with the scoop and the funny thing on the top. And there's the capital T with the serifs going up a tiny bit, and uh, they're the same angle, and they're symmetrical. Here's the E with the wedges in it. It's a pretty sturdy typeface. It's quite readable. Uh, here's an overview of it, which should match what you've got on the handout uh, if you downloaded it and printed it. <clears throat> and you can see the capital A has got that thing on it right up there. And the capital T has got that symmetrical thing with the two serifs that go up. In general, it looks very Cas, I mean, very Garamondish. Uh, the E doesn't have the dirt in the eye, that rounded little space. It's cut off sharper, but it looks kind of Garamondy because it happened right after it. 
Actually, um, Caslin was inspired by Dutch types from the Netherlands, which was a pretty powerful country uh, for a while and had very good printing. Um, so good that English printers would buy their fonts from the Netherlands, and Caslin saw a chance to make money, and that's the way he went. Anyway, let's see what else have I got here. What's the next slide? Oh, yeah, <laughs> speaking of history, <laughs> this is the 78 Honda Accord. Accords used to be this big. That's luxurious. Anyways, um, it, Caslon used to be the Honda font, and um, this is 1980s typography. Look at how close and claustrophobic it is over here. Isn't that amazing? The letters are like crashing into each other. Oh, there's the dotless I, shift option B right there. And uh, over here, you can see the capital T with the anchor look. And uh, anyway, it used to be their font, good old Caslon. Here's the capital A with the scoop back in the uh, Honda Accord ad. Oh, well, anyways, historical. They don't use Caslon anymore. Too bad. Uh, I saw it at the, um, at the spirit shop, as we call it. Here it is on a French wine. Uh, capital T with the two serifs, and there's the A with the scoop out of the top. Hey, Garamond, that's not you, it's Caslon. Caslon. Why would a French guy use Caslon? Who knows? Um, speaking of, um, oh boy, speaking of French history, this is um, a poster for Les Miserables. Let's mispronounce it, huh? Because there's you won't find a more miserable font than this one. It's, it's called Caslon Antique, but it has nothing to do with Caslon. It was originally called 15th century, and nobody used it, so they changed the name to Caslin Antique. Everybody likes antiques, but it's a stereotype. It's a misapprehension of how bad printing once was. It has this uh, idea that printing was horrible way back in the day, but as you know, we never look this bad ever. Uh, so I never use this font, and you never should either. It'll appear again in uh, November when you have Not Scary Farm or stories about zombies, because it's such a disgusting, undead thing. Never use Caslin Antique. It's not even Caslin. There, I said it. Horrible typeface. Um, so here's our uh, Declaration of Independence, the one you see in all your history books, July 4th, 1776. But the truth is, if you were alive in July 4th, 1776, you wouldn't see this, because this was a souvenir they did months later just to have a nice fancy copy. On July 4th, this was what they made. This one, they printed it in type. This one they put in Caslin type because Philadelphia imported their fonts from London. A guy named Dunlap did it. Here's the A with the scoop out of the top. There's the T with the boat anchor. This one, you wouldn't see if you didn't go to Philadelphia because there was no way to print this kind of stuff on a printing press. Uh, everybody from well, Maine, all the way to uh, South Carolina, to Georgia. They saw this one. That's the one. Uh, this particular copy, I think, uh, one of the printed copies was found behind a picture, and it was on Antiques Roadshow, and the guy who found it got like 4 or $5 million for it, which is pretty cool. And this is the one that every American saw. This is the one. Looking good. I was looking at the LA Times a couple years back, and it said, Coming to Cal State Dominguez, the printed version of the Declaration. And I thought, what the heck? And it was perfect, because most people have never heard of this or seen it. They've only seen the history book one, with John Hancock at the bottom. Well, this one is the one that everybody saw. And this is the one that was going around the country a couple years back. And we went to look at it. And there it is. Hey, the original declaration. There's the T that looks like a boat anchor. This is the Caslin font, because we had been, until July 4th, a British colony. And here's the A with the scoop cut out. There it is right there. I'll be darned. And the nice thing was, most people hadn't heard about it, so there was no line. It's like, there's no line at Pirates of the Caribbean, so you run through six times. <laughs> there's just a campus security guard, one of my sons, and here it is on a table with a dumb little tablecloth inside a dumb little wooden frame. That's it. No bulletproof glass, no U.S. Marines, no bodyguards, no armored car. It was great. I couldn't believe it. How cool. Um, anyways, uh, that's a bit of trivia, I suppose, but nice trivia. This is um, two versions of Caslin. I might have said uh, other times, like if you say cheeseburger or pizza, there's a million ways that you can make it. And these are two interpretations of Caslin. I think the one on the top is Adobe Caslin from you know what company, 
There's the A with the thing on the top. There's the T with the boat anchor. It's great for text. It looks okay. Um, the one at the bottom is called Big Caslin. Sorry about that little button there appearing in the way. And Big Caslin comes for free on everybody's Mac. And it, it looks a lot sparklier. It's got more thick and thin in it. Um, so it's good for display type. It's good for printing big. And you'll notice, look at the figures, the numbers on both those fonts. They're not the same. And um, that's not a mistake. That's uh, something that used to be, it used to be every font had two different sets of numbers in it. Um, and I should mention that right now. Look how the, the zero at the very bottom of the page looks like a mistake almost compared to the lowercase o. That's so you could tell the difference when you're putting them back into the type font. So you won't accidentally put the zero in the O or the O in the zero. They're not the same. Anyways, here we go. In many traditional fonts, there, there may be two sets of figures. The kind that are uh, full height, those are called modern figures because they were invented in 1750. <laughs> they're also called lining figures. And they're the same height as capital letters, so they're used as capital letters or with capital letters, if you want to be proper. There we go. And the other kind is called old style figures, uh, also called ranging figures. And you see they have, just like lowercase letters, they have uh, a height that's the height of the X's, X height, and they have ascenders and descenders, just like lowercase letters have got them. So in text, this is less obtrusive uh, and it fits into the story better. Uh, when photo typesetting was invented in the 1970s, they just forgot about these. Like, we don't have enough room for these, so they left them out. So in many books, it'll say, like, um, you know, the War of 1812 was fought in 1812. Or Tommy went down the stairs and brought with him three boxes of shoes. The letters, these letters, are too huge to be used in text, but it's our habit, and we're almost used to the shouting of letters in stories. Anyways, here's, here's how it should be done if you have the time and the patience and a font that has both kinds in it. So Flight 169, you can see, starts with a capital letter. It's a proper name, and so they use uh, figures that have this height, the capital height. These are the modern figures. And December 4th is just a day. There we go. Got it. And 122 is just a time on the clock. It's not that important. It's not a proper thing. Standard Airlines Flight 169, again, has got these modern figures because they match the cap height, but 169 passengers is just set in the old style figures. And it happens to be 15 minutes late, but it gets back in time at Burbank Gate 15, which is the proper name. That's how to use those two guys. Modern figures are used with caps or as caps, and old style figures are used in text or as lowercase. Um, here's another look at all of the Caslons. Uh, well, you know, Caslon regular and Caslon italic. It's got the A with the scoop out of the top. It's got the T with a boat anchor and a generally clumsy and charming old-fashioned look to it. It looks good in text, but you wouldn't use it again for um, an Ikea catalog or something about uh, mid-century modern architecture in uh, Las Vegas, unless you're trying to be ironic. I meant Palm Springs, wrong place. Um, down here, the italic, much like Garamond, is clumsy and trying to be casual and trying to be slanted, even though it's on a square lead body. So there's some strange looking rhythms that happen in there. It's kind of fun. Um, here's how to remember the font one more time. The capital A resembles that TP, kind of, if you decide it does. And the capital T has got the uh, symmetrical serifs, both going above the top, but at equal symmetrical angles. Here's, I hope, the handout that you downloaded, part of it, just to remind you again of everything. You can see the Downton Abbey, that British soap opera about the, about the Abbey, I don't know, that's using Caslon. And the Land's End Company was using it for quite a while. I don't know if they still do, but there's the A with the scoop out of the top. Way to go, fellas. Um, what comes next? Oh yeah. I was walking to my house yesterday and looked. There's a condo right there and said, hey, what do you know? There it is. There's the Caslin font. And a, a nice woman pointed at it for me. So that's, that's how to identify Caslin. Now you know another typeface. You can put it in your um, repertoire. Where's the stop?